Welcome to episode 44 of the Who Threads podcast. Got a very special guest on today. Uh, parent, husband, former NBA player, uh, outspoken uh, media member, uh, Etan Thomas. How's it going? I'm doing pretty good. How you doing? Man, I just want you to know that, honestly, when I started this podcast, that that you were uh, on my dream team of, of people to have on. So this is... Oh, is that right? <laughs> yeah, this is a really cool moment for me. Uh, so cool. let's uh, let's take it all the way back to the beginning and, and talk about you know, your playing career. So, you know, talk about your, your career in high school and maybe how you got to Syracuse. So high school, had a, we had a real special team, uh, to be honest with you, at Booker T. Washington High School in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, we had our W. McCorders who played for, um, went to Oklahoma State. When he, he started playing football, went to the, with the Giants. We had uh, uh, Ryan Humphrey who played in the league for a while. We just had a really good team. And, you know, but I'm originally from New York. And I'm, you know, born in Harlem and my, my parents, my father got transferred with American Airlines. So that's how we moved, ended up in Tulsa, but I spent all my summers in New York. So I grew up loving Big East basketball, going to the garden with my grandfather, watching the Big East tournament, you know, so I knew that style of play was what I wanted to be in. So that's really what I grew up watching. Um, Syracuse, Georgetown, St. John's, Villanova, you know, the old school Big East. Mm. You're out there like just fouling each other. You know what I mean? The physical <laughs> play. Like that was, I was like, woo, this is great. So that's what I, what I always wanted to be a part of. So, you know, I, that's how I ended up at Syracuse. And that's what I grew up watching. Talk about uh, Coach Beheim. Um, when, when he came to see you, I was listening to Eric Devendorf's podcast mm. and you were talking about, I, I don't know if it was his, his first experience seeing you, but, uh, uh he came and saw you play in, in a, uh, in a showcase and, and he, he didn't stay very long. <laughs> oh, so, it, so we were at Nike and, um, and it was funny because my, my Nike teammate, that's when you have the Nike camps and my teammate was Mateen Cleves and we're killing, you know what I mean? We just have a vibe going. Mm. And, you know, Izzo came there to see him and Beheim came there to see me. So we were sitting and that's where we both wanted to go. And so Coach Beheim just came in there, looked for a little while, then he left. And I was like, well, dang, he ain't, he ain't seen much. I guess he ain't interested. And then they sent me a note. They were like, well, no, he saw all he needed to see. So he, you know, definitely, you know, it wasn't that. It was that he wanted to go look at some other people because he saw all he needed to see from you. I was like, oh, okay. Because I, I interpreted it. I interpreted it a whole different way, but yeah, so it worked out. <laughs> He's all about efficiency, man. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's funny. Um, you know, talk about uh, y- your career at Syracuse. You know, you, you spoke a little bit on, on why you chose it, but, you know, talk about your experience there. I want, I do want to let you know that I am uh, an alumni and I did take several classes with uh, Dr. McDonald, who has nothing, oh, okay. nothing but great things to say about you. Well, okay, well that's great, that's great. No, I had a great time at Syracuse. You know, when I when I got there my freshman year, um, you know, I was playing behind Otis Hill, who was a senior. It was right after John Wallace and them had the you know epic run to the championship, Cuse in the house, all of that. So you know, I came in and had to wait my turn. I had to be patient. And it was a uh, freshman year was a tough year at Syracuse because, you know, you go from being the man in, in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Booger T. Washington, we lost like one game my senior year. And, you know, <laughs> it was like we were killing everybody. Our state championship, the whole time we beat everybody by at least 20 points. You know, we had really special to then going to a situation where I'm not playing at all. And all the people from home are like, see, you should have went to Oklahoma school. You should have went, you know, because they weren't very happy that I went all the way to Syracuse. <laughs> so freshman year was a little tough, to be honest with you. It was a little tough, but I learned. And my summer from my freshman year to my sophomore year, I really had a big improvement. I, I got bigger and stronger because we didn't lift weights in high school. But once I saw the Big East, every night was – Jahidi White at, at Georgetown, Jason Lawson at Villanova, Danya Abrams, at, you know what I mean? Um, every Donald Foyle, when we played, you know, it was just, okay, yeah, it was nonstop. And so I was like, wow, I got to get stronger. I, this, this is not going to work if I'm getting to the weight room. So I really, you know, got strong. I was lifting with the football players um, all summer and I came back ready. I came back my sophomore year. I was ready. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, gotcha. Talk about, you know, your junior and senior year kind of taking on a leadership role with that team and, you know, some of the stuff that, that you learned from Coach Beheim. 
Um, a lot. I mean, we had a good, they had Jason Hart and Ryan Blackwell where, you know, people in my class, the seniors, and we, you know, we had some great times. I mean, just learning and growing. Um, you know, I, I had a little knack for blocking shots. So I was like the anchor down in that two, three zone. And it was, it was great. Cause we, we had a reunion. Um, we was watching during the tournament. We we're all talking. It was great. They were like, yeah, sometimes we were just, they, they said it would, it would hurt them defensively because they would just kind of let people go to, to me and then leak out because they knew I was going to block it and I would start <laughs> the break. So, so it was like, it, you know, and then with Tony Bland, I don't know if you remember Tony Bland. He was like, yeah, as soon as they went in, I just took off and we would get breakaway dunks. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was it was a great time, though. And playing in the Dome was so special. Like, yeah. there's so many people. Like, when we had it rocking and we're playing and everything in the whole, like, it was, it, it, it's funny because, you know, when I would go, when I went to the league, um, I'd go to arenas, I'd look around, I was like, huh, this is a little less than the Dome. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we got more fans <laughs> in the Dome. It was just different, but the Dome was just a special place. Yeah, yeah. I I don't think people understand how loud it gets. Yeah. You know, and and they call it a loud house for a reason. And I think people just see the arena and they're like they can't feel it, you know, through the TV. Right. Um one of the coolest parts of my experience I, I was uh, a video assistant, I guess would be my title with uh, Todd Blumen. And so Blue I was actually I was, I was actually, I just spoke with him this morning, actually. I was uh, up in, in the TV's nest with all the cameras. Uh -huh. And um, it, it was some interesting experience. I'm a Buffalo Bills fan. I'm from upstate New York. Okay. And that, that year, the Bills clinched the playoffs um, during the Syracuse game. And as far as the TV nest works, if you take one step to the right, the whole thing rocks. And so I would literally oh. bounce the ESPN <laughs> if I moved. And so I'm just sitting there like, let's go. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I, I couldn't say nothing but you know being up there being able to see the fans and stuff I mean it was it was an incredible experience um talk about what you learn from coach Bayheim. I think he gets he, <laughs> coaches and coaches and athletes talk a lot about the media and and narratives and stuff and I think some of it's warranted um but I really do think it is pretty unfair how a lot of people see him as a bad guy just because he hates answering stupid media questions. Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, talk about what you learned about, you know, from him, you know, on and off the court. I mean, there was so much, you know, I mean, I remember my freshman year. Um, it was really like the first weekend I was there. I was part of this demonstration on campus uh, where they were protesting um, the DPS being able to use pepper spray. So I was I was part of it, and then they took a took a picture of it, and they had they showed me because I'm big, you know what I mean. I stand out, and it looked like I was like I was like on the front cover of the Daily Orange, and, and so uh, I remember because they have called me in. He said, "Yeah, he's like you know I, I read your stuff and saw you speak a lot and do a lot of active things like that, activism in high school." He was like, "I'm gonna give you this one piece of advice." I didn't really know where he was gonna go with this. And he said, listen, I'm never going to be somebody that tells you what you can and can't say to the media. Mm -hmm. He was like, but I'll say that when you do take a stand on something and take a position, be prepared to back it up. Mm -hmm. He's like, as long as you're prepared to back it up and you know what you're talking about, then you say whatever you want to say. But don't mm -hmm. go up there and you don't know what you're talking about because they're going to come after you. Mm -hmm. I was like, OK, that's cool. He was like, yep, that's all I wanted to say. So <laughs> it, it, that was a great experience. So I met when people always ask me, well, did you give me pushback from the coaching staff? And, you know, when you was at Syracuse for speaking on different things, I was like, mm -mm, I did. That wasn't my experience. So, you know, I always give a lot of respect for Coach Beheim for, for, you know, telling me that my freshman year and setting that tone that he wouldn't be someone that's trying to quiet me or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think some, I heard someone describe Coach as he runs his program like, like an NBA Definitely Coach does. Definitely. And, and he definitely just gives you your role. And he's mm -hmm. like, all right, we're not going to talk about this role. And so we, you know, we, until we face it down the line mm -hmm. and he, he does not micromanage one bit. So that does not surprise me at all. Right. Um, so let's talk about Syracuse, you know, let's talk about, you know, that zone as a center, you know, in the two, three, your responsibility area ranges, you know, from the rim to the high post on drives, you know, kind of meeting guards when they split the top. Mm -hmm. And the corner, you know, if one side is overloaded, you know, getting all the way from, you know, the, mm -hmm. the paint to the, to the, to the three point line is, is a difficult ask for a center. Um, you know, talk about that and talk about what you learned uh, playing in that zone. You know, it's interesting because it translated to the, to the NBA, depending on the coach that I had. Now, 
um, Doug Collins first, his style was a little bit different. He mm. had different assignments. And, you know, if your man is closer, if you're closer, you know, he would spend so much time on that's your job to rotate here, not this person, this, you know, he has different where Eddie Jordan, when he came, he wanted the big man to rotate over. And it was a big man that I was, it was a rotation that was, I was used to for mm. Syracuse because it was that I had, I had that area regardless. Yeah. So no matter who it was, that was my rotation. So, yeah. so, you know, if, if Gilbert or Karan or Antoine would get beat on the perimeter, right. Even if I was way over here, that's my rotation, yeah. you know? And so that, so for a lot of different, you know, if you're in a different program, it's not your instinct to have to go over because you're going from that's somebody else's rotation. Mm -hmm. And so that, that really worked out for me well here with the wizards because that's what he wanted. Mm -hmm. And it was an easy transition to me, for me mm -hmm. um, of just knowing the paint area is my area. <laughs> you know what I mean? No matter what. And if I go, that means somebody else has to come and be back for me. Yeah. But I, but they don't even want me to hesitate or like look back to see if somebody is ready to be back for me. They just want me to go. Mm. So that, so for a center, for me, it was great. Now for some perimeter people, you, you have to be able to translate from playing a two, three to playing man to man because the principles are different. Mm. But for me, I, it was great. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and I think it's interesting, too. A lot of people try to kill the guards because they say, you know, it doesn't translate. And to a certain degree, they're right on that. But, you know, the, the help rotations are still there. You know, mm -hmm. stunning at the driver is still there. You know, getting getting into the weak side for a block is, is still there. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the communication is still there. Like, people think that the 2-3 zone is like you're just standing in this little circle. And that's, yeah, you know, that's all you have to do. And that's, <laughs> you know, it, it's so funny when a reporter asks a question like that, like, like, like Bayheim's zone is is a simple, not complicated thing, and I'm like, eh. <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> there's, not accurate at all. there's some there's some sophisticated stuff going on there for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you did play do with Donovan McNabb um, yeah. in college. Um, you know, talk about that experience and uh, you know what you you saw in him as a basketball player and you know as a leader. He was good. You know what I mean? He he had to pay, pick one. Eventually, you're going to have to pick one. <laughs> I think I think his decision worked out for him. But he yeah. could definitely play ball, though. Like, he wasn't yeah. just a – you know, sometimes you get football players trying to play basketball, and they, they I was like, you're like, no, that's a foul. You can't do that. You're not, you're not on the football field. That's All that is fouls. You know what I mean? But he's actually someone that had basketball skills, yeah. um, and he could play. So, and it was, it was, it was great, you know, and he's a funny guy and he's a, you know, he's a character guy and keeps everybody loose. And I, I, I thought it was great playing with him, but you know, he made a good decision for him. It, it worked out for him. <laughs> if you didn't go to Syracuse, where would you have gone and why? Ah, well, you know, Syracuse fans hate when I say this, but, no, there we go. but I, I, know. but I, but I did always love Georgetown. I, yeah. I did. I grew up loving you know, Alonzo Mourning was like my favorite player. I grew up a Knicks fan because I'm from New York. My grandfather was a Knicks fan. So, I, you know, I, I loved watching them with Tumbo, the, the big style, um, you know, John Thompson. That That's really, you know, that honestly, that was actually my first choice of where I wanted to go. But they had a whole lot of big men at the time. Mm. And, uh, you know, Syracuse just had one big man who was leaving. So it, that was kind of the easy choice from there, but yeah, uh, it would have definitely been Georgetown. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, how does your playing career uh, impact your coaching? I, I think I know this and I'm going to be upset if I'm wrong. It's the enlightened disciples, right? Uh, dynamic disciples. Close. Dynamic disciples it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> yeah, it definitely impacts, you know, I, I mean, I go back to how I was coached when I was coached in AAU. And so I had a similar situation where, I played for a church team. Um, the pastor was actually the, uh, the coach. And <laughs> what he did was he taught us about life and he used everything to teach a lesson. Like everything was always a lesson. And it was really to prepare us for life. Now we were good. Like we won, we had talent, you know, everything like that. But it was really not just about basketball. Like we had certain standards that we had to do. Like we had to make sure our grades were right or we wouldn't be able to play for, for the tournament. That's the same thing I do. With, with my guys or, you know, conduct is like, you know how you see some guys at AAU. Like I am surprised, like every, nothing from parents to players, the AAU world is like the exhibition of the worst behavior that you can possibly imagine. And I was just like, nah, that's not gonna work with my parents or my players. And I have them all sign contracts. 
Yeah. And the contract is a, a code of conduct. Yeah. And and if, if you don't follow the code of conduct, you get one warning, then you're dismissed. Yeah. Period. Because I cannot have what I see happening in other programs. It's like, you know, culture from the stands, yelling, parents going crazy, kids have an attitude, fussing. I was like, no, nah, that's not going to work with me at all. <laughs> so, so that's that's one thing I, I had to, you know, I was a stickler with that. I was like, I don't care how good you can play. I am not going to tolerate that at all. It's it, it's funny sometimes when you see, like, you go to a tournament and you see the coach walk in, you know, with with a bucket hat and some Tims, and you're just like, oh, this is going to be an experience. Yep, you already know, right? <laughs> <laughs> you already know. <laughs> oh Lord! Yeah. All right, so yeah, let's move on to the NBA. You know, mm-hmm. so you were you were picked in the lottery. You know, twelfth uh, overall by the Dallas Mavericks. You know, talk mm-hmm. about you know that draft night experience. You know, talk about the. Um, talk about the experience of, you know, going through the workouts and, you know, talking to GMs and like the types of questions that they're asking you, because that's always been interesting to me. Oh, it was an amazing process. You know, I mean, my, my range, I went 12, my range was from eight to 15. So I, I worked out for all those teams plus, you know, two up ahead and two below. So I worked out for a lot of teams. Yeah. And so you're, you're, you're preparing yourself and the, the questions are like a job interview. You know, they're asking you questions about your personality, things that you're into, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know how much they they pay attention to it. I don't know if it's as much as the NFL, because I've heard a whole lot of different stories with the NFL. But yeah, it was like a job interview. And then you had to be in shape and they run you through all these different drills. And, you know, everybody's just looking at you. It's kind of it's kind of weird at first, but then you just kind of get used to it. Um, but I always liked it better when you had another player there with you. So you're kind of you have some competitive stuff or somebody running the drills with you. It's not just you doing every every drill. You know what I mean? It was just yeah. a little different. But, yeah, it was an amazing experience. Amazing. Gotcha. And you were were you a part of a draft day trade? Oh, uh, no, no, no. So I got I got traded during the year yeah. when um, when Jawan Howard was with the Wizards yeah. and and he got traded to Dallas. And literally like six or seven of us went from Dallas to, to Washington. Because, you know, he had a high contract. So it took like seven of us to match up with his contract. And that's how that's how the trade happened. So talk about that process, you know, of, you know, the the, the transactional, you know, ex- experience of being an NBA player. And, you know, you're not property, but, you know, it's it's definitely, you know, like you're an asset and it, and it's a business. And there's a lot of stuff that I've heard as far as, you know, players when they're moving and stuff, they're like, you guys just kind of see, you know, Aaron Proya traded on the ticker. You're not thinking about the fact that, you know, I have to move my whole family. Right. You know, my, my kids got to go to a different school now. You right. know, my wife has to leave her job and find another one. Yeah. You know, talk about some of the stuff that goes on uh, behind the scenes, you know, and what it feels like to be traded and, you know, what that experience is like. It's definitely a, a, a different experience. You know, it's, it's interesting because I remember after the decision, um, with LeBron in Cleveland and everybody was in this big uproar and then you saw players be like what y'all mad for that happens all the time with the organizations they don't ever tell us you just you know and you, and you hear player after player saying I mean Shaq he said he he, he found out he was being traded because his son was watching TV and it came across a ticker and he was like dad you just got traded you know like I've heard all these I remember Jerry Stackhouse was in the middle of doing an interview and it was with Tom Arnold of all people and, and so Tom Arnold came back and he said, hey, you just got traded. He was like, I did? Like, you know what I mean? Like those, those kind of situations, you see them all the time. So when everybody was in an uproar about LeBron not telling, you know, uh, Dan Gilbert and everybody what his, what his thoughts were and decision was, we were like, man, please, you don't owe anybody anything. They, they, it never is reciprocated. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a process where it's like right after they come out publicly and say, this person will not be trained or they tell you, listen, we want you um, as a part of our future and we value you. We're a family here. And then two days later, you find out you got traded. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, yeah. and it happens all the time in the league and it's just, it's just unfortunate. Talk about, you know, a vet that kind of took you under their wing, you know, as a, as a rookie or as a young player and, and some of the stuff that you learned from them, I'm sure a lot of it was off the court. Well, this is this is crazy, and people always like are amazed when I say this. But when I went to the Wizards, right, and they asked me, so the guys were asking, "Hey, but who do you talk to on the team? Who's all cool and everything like that?" And I'm like, "Y'all are not gonna believe this." 
okay? <laughs> but Christian Leitner is the coolest dude on earth. And everybody's like, Christian Leitner? Like, oh, no. Like, I'm telling you. My locker was right next to his the whole time with the Wizards while he was there. I was like, he is the coolest dude. Like, he's he's telling me different stuff. He's, you know, explaining, breaking down. I talk to him all the time. I was like, what? I was like, and when I first met him, I said to him, I grew up hating your guts. <laughs> that is the honest truth. And he laughed and said, yeah, I, I get that a lot. <laughs> I was about to say, probably not the first time he's heard that. <laughs> but literally, coolest dude on earth. Like, I, honestly. And he was like a super vet, and he really, you know, broke different stuff down to me and everything like that. And we just would sit there in the corner. He'd be like, yeah, see, and he, that player there, he's doing this wrong. But watch how it's going to work out for him. He's like, I'm not even going to say that. You know what I mean? Like, it would just be, he just, he, he was a good guy. <laughs> Crazy, right? You didn't think I was going to say that, did you? <laughs> it breaks my heart as a UNC fan <laughs> to hear that. I, I just wanted to continue hating him and Pete, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> apparently, yeah. apparently he's a good guy. He is. Uh, talk about, I think it's your either third or fourth season. You know, you guys make the playoffs. You win a first mm -hmm. round series. And then, you know, you end up getting swept by the heat. Talk about that, you know, that experience, you know, the difference in the playoff environment, you know, this, this step up in intensity. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I feel like I've never seen an NBA coach in the playoffs that doesn't have, like, just sunken eyes. And right, right, <laughs> right. Like, like, like they got, like you know, they haven't slept at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was exactly. looking at T. Lou the other day because, you know, we were teammates. <laughs> I was like, hey, T. Lou, your eyes look terrible. <laughs> I texted him. He was like, man, ain't much sleep going on. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, no, it was – it's so intense. We had that first – um that, that first round against the Chicago Bulls. Yeah. And it was, you know, that was an intense series. I and mean, the Bulls were stacked. They had a, they were loaded uh, with young talent, a lot of young talent. It was Tyson, mm -hmm. Tyson Chandler, Eddie Curry, all of them. Kirk yeah. Heinrich, they had a lot of young talent. But, yeah, when we got out that series, and then we ran into Miami. And it was like it was like Shaq and Zoe and D-Wade. And uh, it was, yeah, we wasn't ready for that. But, um, <laughs> hey, we gave it our best. That's all you can say. We gave it our best. So you were in some some locker rooms with some colorful characters, you know, uh -huh. from Gilbert Arenas, Kwame Brown, you know, MJ, uh -huh. Stackhouse, Deshaun Stevenson. Mm -hmm. um, what's – talk about, you know, coaches keeping the peace and, you know, having to manage egos and then maybe a good story or two that's, you know, TV appropriate. <laughs> I think it's interesting because, you know <sighs> – you know, there's a lot with when MJ was playing. It was like traveling with Michael Jackson or like the Beatles or something like that. It was like a big or both of them. <laughs> right, right. Put together <laughs> like literally everywhere we went. It was like pandemonium, like people, you know, flashing pictures and people like would look at him and start crying. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> Michael Jackson back in the day or like pass out. Like, well, I saw all of that and it was so crazy because I was like, wow. You know, because I'm, you know, young in the league. I was like, wow, is this this what the this what the league is like? And Christian Leighton over there, like, no, they're 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 here for MJ. And I hear <laughs> just to let you know. I was like, oh, okay, all right. <laughs> no, but it was it was it was it's something like you can't even you know describe because after a while, after you see somebody every single day, yeah. you get used to them. But then when you go out with them, you know, and you see other people's reactions to them, you're like, oh. Yeah, this is MJ. You know what I mean? Like it was, it was crazy. But yeah, no, that that experience of playing with MJ, and everybody knew that this was like the last time that he was going to be playing, especially that second year. And every game was like the farewell tour. Like he knew they knew, you know. So everybody wanted to get a glimpse. And we saw like, you know, after the game, people come into the back of the locker room and want to meet people. But these are all like famous people that want to come in and they're like lining up like little kids like this wanting yeah. to meet MJ but it's like you know he ain't like every famous person that you could think of in a line like you see the little kids lined up and it was just yeah, it was just amazing what's the craziest who's like what, what's an experience of someone that you met just being a part of MJ's you know entourage sounds wrong but you know I'm sure you guys went out to clubs and stuff like that together you know, do you have any, you know, crazy literally everybody when I say everybody is literally <laughs> everyone. And you're like, wow, because you're looking at them you're like, wait a minute, this 
they're movie stars. Like they're <laughs> they're stars themselves, you know what I mean? But they're literally looking like little kids waiting to to get a picture with MJ. You know what I mean? And it's just that that was like there was a long list, like everyone. Like when I say everyone, literally everyone. <laughs> and 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 in DC, this was the crazy part because um you know how like in LA they have like celebrity row and stuff like that. Well, that's how it was in DC after uh MJ came. <laughs> but it wasn't like that before. Before it was it was literally like I would say a hundred a couple hundred people in the stands. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like, you know, but then MJ came, we had celebrity role. We it was like everyone wanted to get a glimpse. It was yeah. it was crazy. And yeah. like I remember like he would shoot his free throws and you would just see flash, 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 cameras lit from everywhere. Like it was it was, it was crazy. I'm sure that still happened on the road too. So. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So we go one place and it's packed with people, and they're just waiting to see MJ walk from the bus, for, you know what I mean, from the plane to the bus, <laughs> or from the from the bus into the hotel, and they're just sitting there waiting. Like it was, yeah, it was great. So I gotta ask, you know, I'm, I'm sure you watched the Last Dance, mm-hmm. and when you saw how he was with teammates, I'm sure you weren't surprised. <laughs> no, because I saw him like that with Kwame. Yeah. And it was, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't like that with me. He wasn't like that with, you know, a lot of different people, but I saw him like that with Kwame. Yeah. And that was the one where, you know, cause Kwame was, Kwame was 17, 18 years old at the time. Yeah. And so that part was just like, you know, I was like, why is he doing that? <laughs> he's like, he's a kid, you know? And so that, you know, that was tough to be honest with you. And MJ was such a competitor. Like yeah. he just wanted to win. And it was like, it was the wrong situation for Kwame to be in. Now, yeah. if MJ never would have came out of retirement and it was just all us young cats just out there hooping yeah. on a team that's going to win, what, 19 games for the season? And we just all hooping and don't nobody care if we win or lose, yeah. then it would have been a totally different situation. You would have seen a totally different Kwame. So I was going to ask that question next. If Kwame Brown was drafted to... Any place else. Any, <laughs> Any place else. What, what what type of player do you think? Like, what was his ceiling? Do you think he's you know perennial all star? Do you think you know he makes Listen, number two? I, or? I tell people this all the time. Like, I saw the workouts when he came in, and they brought all the top players um, to the Wizards to work out against each other. So Tyson Chandler came, you know, and Kwame, and they paired them together, and Eddie Curry, and there's some other big men, and Kwame destroyed all of them. Like, it wasn't even close. It wasn't close. I was sitting there watching. They brought Tyson in twice. It wasn't close. And Kwame, Kwame was light years ahead of both of them. So he was the number one pick. Yeah. And then at the same time, I saw Doug Collins and MJ literally take his confidence mm. and berate him. And he was in an impossible situation where mm. he couldn't have been successful in that situation. Mm. And it was it's just unfortunate because... You know, but now, now you see Kwame, you know, after 20 years of being silent, now he's had enough. He has a whole lot to say, right? <laughs> Kwame didn't say anything. All, he, he handled that situation with so much poise and maturity yeah. that I was always surprised at how he even was able to do that at 17 and 18 years old. Mm. So, you know, it's, it, it, was really, it was really a tough situation. So, yeah. Let's uh. I'm interested as a coach, you know, people talk a lot about buy-in, you know, Mm -hmm. talk about the coach who got the most out of you and what they did to accomplish that. I was easily Eddie Jordan um, because when he came, he was just like, listen, I don't, you know, care about what happened before. You know, I'm going to reward the people who work the hardest and do what I ask you to do. I was like, oh, cool. That sounds great. You know, I can do that. <laughs> so like what I was saying before about when he was talking about what he wanted the big men to do. Yeah. He wanted the big men to rotate over regardless of what I was like, cool, I'll do that. So so he he had this thing. It was the Princeton offense and um, the dribble handoff come from the top of the key and the big man would dribble down there and hand it off. Right. Mm-hmm. I was like, cool. You want me to do that? I, I never really done that, but I'll work on that. So he saw me in the gym working on the dribble handoff uh, coming that rolling afterwards that because that's what he wanted that's mm-hmm. what he wanted that's what i do mm-hmm. other people were kind of resistant to it mm-hmm. because they were like well you know that's not my rotation or you know well you know i don't why am i dribbling from the top of the key 
Yeah. I didn't ask why. You told me to do this. This is what I'm going to do. <laughs> so that's why I, he he rolled it, rewarded me for it. Okay, you do what I'm asking you to do. You're going to play. And I did it. And it's in, and I, I tell all the time with different players, I'm like, listen, you're not going to win a fight with a coach because you think the offense should work a certain way. That's not going to work. He's just not going to play you. Yeah. <laughs> that's not going to work. You're not going to win that. The coach has their philosophy. So even if it's something that you're not used to doing or you would rather not do, get a coach what he want. Coach wants you to do that, you do that. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So that's what worked out for me. Last playing career you know, question. What was the most connected team you were on and what went into that? I guess this could be, you know, this could be college included as well. I'm a Syracuse guy. We'll allow it. Oh, yeah, no, we were <laughs> definitely connected in college. That, that Our senior year, we had a special, you know what I mean, a special bond. Uh, but I'll also say that young Oklahoma City Thunder team because mm. they were so young and they were so green. And me and Kevin Ollie would just be sitting back. We was like, these cats have no idea how good they are, do they? <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, no, they have no clue. It was James Harden's rookie year. James Harden came up to me and when I first met him and he said, um, nice to meet you, sir. I grew up watching you. I was like, what you mean you grew up watching me? <laughs> but then I was like, okay, wait, if I do the math, he only went in college for one year. Yeah, I guess he did grow up watching me. They were young. Serge Ibaka was like a kid. Yeah. They were young, young. And it was Westbrook's second year. Like they didn't, they had no idea. They were just out there, but they were a close. It was funny because we would, go, we would be at um, leave practice, right? Mm. And they were like, hey, um, you know, me and Kevin Ollie, we're we were older then. We have families, you know what I mean? We're gonna go back to our family stuff. They're like, hey, we're gonna go walk around the mall. Y'all wanna come? We're like, the mall. <laughs> no, we don't want to walk around the mall. <laughs> Are you serious? But they were little kids, they were kids. So they they put on their little clothes and go walk around the mall. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, no, it's a different age gap here. <laughs> That's not what we have an interest in doing. Hey, did your daddy give you money? You know what I'm saying? They were, they were kids. I hope you flame them for that because I definitely would have. Uh, <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. We just laughed. We just laughed to ourselves. We, we was like, yeah, these, these cats are really, they're young. <laughs> so, um, you know, let's talk about Gilbert Arenas and, you know, maybe like Terrell Owens. You know, those situations both escalated to narratives of being bad teammates, bad people, you know, bad humans because of their their conduct instead of, you know, actual missteps. You know, black coaches are fired and white coaches are mutually parted with. Um, talk about how black athletes and coaches are treated differently by the media and by the public. Well, there's definitely a difference. Um, you know, as far as Gilbert Arenas, you know, I, I always tell people he is he's not who everybody thinks he is. Um, this is for a while. This is before, you know, he really started getting on social media and people really started to see, you know, his personality. It was just all they remembered was the, the gun incident. And so I would be on different shows and they would use Gilbert Arenas as the example of the, you know, horrible athlete. I was like, wait a minute, time out. No, that's not who Gilbert Arenas was. Now he made a terrible decision. I'll, I'll agree with that, but that is not, all he is you know he is someone who when i'm telling him all this stuff i was like yeah we have conversations and we have political discussions they're like wait gilbert arenas has political discussions i was like y'all have no idea who gilbert arenas is i was like y'all know agent zero y'all know agent zero y'all know hibachi and all that other stuff but y'all don't know gilbert arenas and they're not the same people and it, that's so that was always really hard for people to understand because with athletes a lot of times they identify with what they know of you or so like for say for instance for myself i was a physical type of a player mm. um that was the way that i that i that i played i played that like that in college i played like that in the pros but i'm not that way in regular life you know what i mean not just walking around elbowing somebody but a lot of times people think that you know when they first say, okay he's gonna be like you know like i see him on the court and no, that's not what it is. But a lot of people didn't know athletes. But now with social media, a lot of people are getting a chance to know athletes on a, in, a, in a way that they didn't know them back in the day. Yeah. Like in the 90s and the early 2000s when there was no social media, you didn't know anything about athletes. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, that's, that's a good thing. Um, but a lot of times, you know, as far as the difference, 
in structure, I mean, in the uh, treatment and view of black athletes versus white athletes or black coaches versus white coaches, that's just a reflection of society. Um, I just watched this video yesterday and had to, you know, show my, my kids about Ocean City and mm -hmm. the Ocean City Police Department. And they tased this young cat. Um, young cat was 17, 18 years old up there, you know, chilling with people. And they, they suspected that he was vaping and they tased him and hog tied him and beat the other dude for saying anything and brought him in. I was like, I've seen white kids do 10 times worse in Ocean City while we were down there for tournaments and none of that happened to them. And so I would tell my, my, my guys, listen, the rules are different for you. You have to do conduct yourself differently. That's just the way that the world is. It's not fair. No, it shouldn't be that way, but that's the way that it is. And that's, that's, it goes from there all the way up to everything you're talking about in professional, with pros, with coaches, with everything, there's a different measuring stick. That's just, that's just the reality. I remember I, it sounds so weird to say I follow you on Facebook. I feel like I'm dating myself now. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I remember reading about an experience you had where you, you got pulled over and, you know, you had your son and, and some of his teammates in the car. Can you talk about that experience and then also your first encounter with, with the police officer back in Tulsa? So with that experience, we were coming from um, AU practice. And anybody that knows AU, sometimes you just end up having to take guys home as a coach. That's just what happens. Yeah. So, you know, we we're there with his teammate, Kamar, and we were driving and we got pulled over by the police. And it was this, you know, when you get pulled over and it's dark and they're coming up to you, it's just an intense situation. So immediately I, you know, rolled down the window, turned off the TV, put on the interior lights, put my you know, took my wallet out, put it on the dashboard, um, got my, you know, registration, put it there, um, put my phone on record and put my hands at 10 and two. <clears throat> so I'm doing all this and my son Malcolm and they're like, what, what is all this that you're doing? And so I come up, they come up there, they, they you know, they ask me, you know, how are you doing officer? You know, license registration. All right. So uh, my license is right here on my dashboard. I'm going to reach for it slowly. Is that okay? And they said, yes. And then the other person, the, um, the other cop shined his light on my hands and I slowly reached over to get the license and it slowly gave it back to him. And so, you know, Malcolm was kind of set after that. He was like, well, why did you have to do all that? That's not fair. It's what... it, it ended up that the reason why they stopped me was because I had a tail light that was out. And so he was like, but all that for a tail light that's out? Like they acted like we was, you know what I mean? Some big criminals and that's not fair. So I had to tell them, that listen, you know, it, when you're stopped, when we're stopped, we have to de-escalate uh, the situation, even though we didn't escalate it in the first place. But it's escalated because of the color of our skin. That's just reality. It should, again, it shouldn't be that way. It's messed up that it is that way. But the reality is that's the way that, you know, you have to conduct yourself when the police stop you. And it's not fair. So that was like a, a, a teaching point. And they were both, you know, confused, mad, you know, upset that it happened. And, you know, it was like, it, we shouldn't have to do all of that. I was like, you're right. I agree with you. We shouldn't have to do all that. But we do. You know what I mean? We have to do that. Now, um, you know, white kids, white people, they could cuss out the police. They could spit on the police. They could, you know, have your badge number, you pig, like all that stuff. I, I used to, I used to be amazed at, at, at Syracuse, the way I would see some of the white, you know, fraternity houses and stuff like that. Mm. Like they would be drunk, cussing out the police. We, we all be looking at like, wow, <laughs> because we couldn't do any of that. We couldn't even roll our eyes or it's a big issue. They come in pepper spray everybody or just, you know, it's just, a di there's, there's two different treatments. Yeah. And, and it's just something that, you know, we know that happens and you have to have the talk. You've heard of the talk that black parents have to have with their children is, and again, it's not fair, but that's, that's the way that it is in society. Yeah. Talk, talk about that first encounter with, you know, a police officer in Tulsa. And, you know, I know that you, you know, wrote a poem about that, that, you know, you, you ended up reciting in a lot of different locations. Talk about that experience. Right. You did your homework. I see. Yes, so, sir. so yeah. So in, in high school, you know, I was, I had, I got my little car and everything. I was driving to uh, a game. We was playing against a big rival, Central High School. <clears throat> and I turned right on Pine and Peoria, and uh, the cops pulled me over. 
And what they used to do back in the day is when, you know, when they pull over, especially young black men, they always make you get out the car and sit on the curb. And that was like a routine. You already know. You're going to have to get out the car and you have to sit on the curb. So, you know, they pulled me over, you know, three or four different police cars came uh, as backup, lights flashing, put, had me sit on the curb. I'm sitting there. One cop is over here, you know, with his gun, with his hand, like right over his gun, waiting for me to move or do something. And they're searching my car for like 30, 40 minutes. They're like, no, no, no. I've seen him before. No, he looks familiar. Keep running everything. You know, I hear them talking and stuff like that. So, you know, I remember seeing all the people drive by looking at me. It was like, you know, all embarrassing, all big dramatic situation. So 45 minutes go by and one of the cops asked me, they said, all right, um, can you can you open your trunk? And I remember I said, well, don't you need a warrant or something like that for that? And the way they all immediately turned around and looked at me, I remember I jumped, you know, and I was like, all right, go ahead. You know, and they, and they opened the trunk and they held up my uh, Booker T. Washington uh, duffel bag. And they said, oh, he plays for Booker T. That's where, that's where we've seen him before. All right. And they all got in their cars and went. And they said, all right, stay out of trouble. And they left. And I'm standing there like, are they serious? Like, stay out of trouble. They done did this big. So I went to the game pissed. You know, I think I fouled out. I done, I done elbowed everybody real aggressive, hard. You know, I was, and I remember I didn't sleep that night. So I'm, I'm, I'm in school the next day and I'm in speech and debate class and I'm talking to this little, little white girl that was um, listening to my whole story. She was, she was sitting next to me, Brandy, I remember it. And I'm telling her, yeah, and the cops did this and they did this and I should have said this and they only did this because I'm black and all this stuff. So she's just, you know, sitting there like this. And my speech, <laughs> my speech teacher said, you know, told me to come to his office and he said, listen, everything I've been hearing, I've been listening to you say everything you're saying. He's like, you should turn that into your OO. OO was the original oratory. He's like, so make, make that into your speech. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I'm not trying to write no speech right now. I didn't want to come to school today. My mom made me come <laughs> to school. He was like, no, no, no. He's like, people need to hear that and they'll hear it from you because you're an athlete. So I was like, huh. So I went, wrote the speech and that was my OO. And I started doing it everywhere and it was getting a lot of attention and I wrote about it in the papers and all this different stuff, but that's when I made the connection that people will hear it just because I play basketball, mm. you know, and I had a lot of people coming up to me and saying, Hey, thanks for, you know, saying what you're saying. I read about it or I saw it on the news or everything like that. And, you know, that happens to us all the time, but don't nobody want to hear us saying it. So that's when I made that connection. So really from that point on, that's when I found my voice, you know, and that's when I kept using my voice, as I, you know, kept playing and going to different levels. Gotcha. Um, let's talk about, you know, the, a poem that your son Malcolm wrote. Um, mm-hmm. I, I feel I feel dumb every time I talk to Malcolm because he's just, just like, yo, your vocabulary <laughs> is way too good for a fourteen-year-old man. <laughs> so uh, he said, "They're all for athletes for using their voices until they say something that they don't like," and th- and right. that line really hit me. Um, Talk about, you know, society, the, the, the shut up and dribble thing, the, mm-hmm. you know, I don't care about hearing when an athlete has to say thing. It, it's weird that, I mean, it's not weird. It's, it's sad that we treat uh, entertainers and, and, you know, athletic performers like they're not human beings. And they're just like, no, I don't really care about what you have to say outside right. of that 94 feet of hardwood. You know, talk about, you know, that experience and, and talk about, you know, Malcolm and, you know, the way that, that you're raising him and then things that you're teaching him. Well, you know, I, I've been taking Malcolm and, you know, all my kids with me to different things since they were little. And, you know, I started off with Malcolm just having him, you know, if, I, if I'm speaking somewhere, he would start off and maybe just say a prayer mm-hmm. and, you know, he would do that sometimes. He was like little. Like I saw videos like, dang, Malcolm, was he like six then? <laughs> like he's like little. Like he pray before we start the event, then, then we start the event. And then it kind of graduated to him writing his own poems and starting the event that way. And mm-hmm. so that's how, you know, he got a comfortability of, of speaking in front of crowds mm-hmm. because it just kind of had him doing that all the time with me, you know, of course, before COVID. COVID changed everything. <laughs> but, you know, but I was speaking at different universities and things of that nature, and I was just taken with me. And in that poem, you know, he, he, was, he was noticing, when we were talking about Kaepernick, that a lot of the conversation was that 
people praise athletes for speaking out, you know, and this happens from both sides. This isn't just a, you know, a right or the left. This is literally both sides do this. Yeah. Um, they praise athletes for speaking out until they disagree with them. So yeah. if, if they agree with what they're speaking on, then it's, oh, this athlete is, is great and wonderful. He's speaking, have the courage to be able to, and both, again, both sides doing this. Yeah. But then when the athlete says something they disagree with, then it's like, oh, well, you need to just stay in your lane. You need to just shut up and dribble. You need to just, you know, you, you're just a basketball player. You shouldn't be talking about this anyway. Mm. And he's 100% correct, <laughs> you know? I mean, because people like to put you in a box and they want you to take on the positions that they feel and then they can support you. But if you take on a position that's different than them, it kind of ruins it for them. Yeah. You know what I mean? It ruins. I'm like, oh, you, you're, you, I thought you was pro this, but you're anti this. Oh, well, now I can't root for you. Now I don't look at you the same. <laughs> now I don't, you know, it is amazing how that happens. Yeah. It's like, well, we just have a different opinion on this topic. It can't just be that. And that's not how people are. So, you know, it, well, what he said in the poem is 100% true. People are, you know, all supportive of athletes speaking out until they disagree with them. Hmm. What were some of your goals for the rematch and your other media ventures? Um, well, actually, I don't know. Let, let's hold on to that question for a second. Okay. What's the dumbest question that a port, reporters ask you or a question that you really hate having to deal with? I mean, reporters honestly have asked so many dumb questions, <laughs> to be honest with you. That's why when, when I see Coach Mayhem going off for of reporters, I understand because they really, sometimes some of the questions, you're like, that's your question? <laughs> like, like I, I was watching um, KD, um, and he had like a real good game. And the reporter asked him, um, did you ever think you would be able to have a good game after you got injured? I, and, and he was like, that's your question? He was like, what, I was supposed to say no? I never thought I would. Yes, I thought I would be, you know. <laughs> but reporters, I don't know. Sometimes it's just. It kills me the way that they, how they set up their questions sometimes. They're like, you just lost by 37 points and, you know, got eliminated from the series and you're going to catch a lot of this blame. How do you feel about that? It's like, right. Like, like you know how like they that. feel about that. A question <laughs> like that. I'm like, you know, it's, it's tough. You know, but it's, but really, I think that media training is something that athletes should have starting at a young age. Mm. And, you know, I talked to Malcolm a lot about how people, when they say the wrong things in the media and how it goes from there. Like I use, like, so, so I'll give you an example. He was a huge RG3 fan when RG3 came, first came to DC. As everybody, it was like RG3 mania, right? Mm. But then I showed him, I was like, all right, look, look how the, the reporter set RG3 up for this question. He's like, so, you know, you were playing great, would, wouldn't it be better if you had a few more seconds to be able to, you know, without running for your life, you know, to be able to throw the ball <laughs> or something like that? And RG3 said, you're absolutely right. You know, I'm on, I was like, oh, he took the bait because he was trying <laughs> to set it up so he could point, you know, throw his teammates under the bus and everything went bad from there. Kind of like, um, you know, uh, Willie Beeman and um, what's the movie? Um, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. 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 So, and how he started, he talked about them the Sunday. offensive line. Any given Sunday, right. I was like, there's a way you have to know how to handle the media. And when they ask you a question, you have to be able to flip it on them and not react to their question, even if it's a dumb question. You know what <laughs> I mean? Or they're trying to ask you a question to elicit a certain response. Mm. You know, so they were like, wow, you know, that was some interesting coaching decisions that, that your coach did there. Put it. Don't you think that you would have been able to, you know, and then I uh, see the play. You're right. I, if I was in there, I would have, and then every, that's, that's the bat. That's the setup. You took the bait. Yeah. So it's all those media tricks that you just got to know. But I think players need to be able to be, to be taught that and trained to be able to handle the media from a young age. I really do. Yeah, I feel like there should be a uh, a voting system after each session, and like one media member gets voted off for one game. Basically, <laughs> yeah. I remember CP3 in the playoffs; he was down three one, and like you know, CP3, you're down three one. Do you think you can come back in this series? He's like, what do you want me right. to say? No, yeah, no, I don't think I, I come back. That. No, I don't want to play this next game. Like, yeah. what? Come on, man. Yeah. Um, so you know, talk about you know those media ventures though, and, and some of your goals, you know, for the rematch and and, and other stuff, and um. 
I'm sure a lot of that comes from, you know, being an athlete and, and being frustrated with, you know, how you're portrayed or your, your teammates are portrayed, you know, talk about some of the goals that you have and, you know, how you kind of seek to be different. Definitely. That was the whole point of creating the rematch. Cause I want to, you know, have guys be able to be reintroduced to um, the world, you know, and be able to retell their story and be able to tell, you know, a lot of times, like I said before, you know, people have watched guys play and have no idea who they are or they have a certain perception of them that isn't accurate, or there's certain, you know, like, like Gilbert, I had Gilbert on the rematch and the, we, we talked about everything. And, uh, you know, after everybody saw that episode, they're like, wow, I see Gilbert kind of differently. I didn't really, really know, or uh, I haven't heard him speak like this, you know, and, and that's the whole goal of it to introduce someone, um, you know, to the world and show them a different side of the athlete. So that's what, that's what I wanted to create it. Gotcha. You know, talk about your book, you know, I think it's called We Matter Athletes and Activism. Talk about, you know, the process of writing that. And I think you're you're in the process of writing another one, right? I am. So We Matter Athletes and Activism was really, you know, when there was this boom of athlete activism after Kaepernick and yeah. everything. And I wanted to talk to the athletes that I really grew up admiring, you know, from the past. So I was able to talk to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Bill Russell and John Carlos and, you know, Mahmoud Abdul-Aruf and Craig Hodges, it was like amazing. Um, but I also wanted to talk to current athletes and, and see, you know, really encourage the younger generation to continue using their voice. So, you know, so I spoke to, you know, D. Wade and Russell Westbrook and Carmelo and Eric Reed and Torrey Smith and all those guys in NFL and NBA uh, in particular about, you know, what gave them the courage to use their voices and their platform. So that's that was, it was, it was, it was a fun, fun project. It was really, a, um, you know, it has been really received really well. So when you, cause when you hear guys tell their stories and then different stories, like how I just told my story of what happened to me in high school, everybody has a story like that. So a lot of times people think that athletes are in this protective bubble where we don't have to deal with the regular issues that everyday black people have to deal with. You know what I mean? It's like, no, that's not what it is. So yeah. it's also been used as a, you know, conversation, you know, starter and, um, you know, really in going in different colleges and universities, a lot of people have been really shocked to read some of the stories. Mm -hmm. um, and so in this next book that I just finished now, um, dealing with um, police brutality mm -hmm. and really with white supremacy and police brutality and the history of how they intertwine mm -hmm. and um, going all the way back, you know, we just, it's interesting being from Tulsa, we grew up knowing about the Tulsa race massacre Mm. A lot of the country didn't know about it. You mm. know what I mean? I literally, my middle school was literally seven minutes away from where Black Wall Street was, <laughs> seven minutes. And so I grew up knowing about it. I remember going to Syracuse and being in an economics class and the, and the professor mentioned it. And then he paused and he said, that, he said, how many of you know about the Tulsa race massacre? It was a big lecture hall. And I put my hand up I looked around. There was like three people. And, you know, one of the person People were from um, Texas and two of them from Oklahoma, but nobody else had ever even heard of it. And mm -hmm. I was like, wow, y'all, y'all don't know what happened. You know what I mean? Like I was just amazed, but yeah. So let me, you know. let me speak on that real quick, if you don't mind. So there, have, have you heard about a long talk about the uncomfortable truth? The uncomfortable truth. Yeah. Yeah. That the team takeover put together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I kind of went through that experience and it was really eye opening and, and frankly, like really upsetting at the yeah. end. Of, I was just mad about the fact that I was like, dude, I've made it through yeah. 27 years of life mm -hmm. and I've made it through, you know, public school, mm -hmm. like nine years of private school, mm -hmm. JUCO, went to a small state school, SUNY Cortland, and then went to grad school at Syracuse. Mm -hmm. And I didn't hear about Tulsa until I was 27 years old. <laughs> that's how most people are. <laughs> that's why when you have the, you hear the debate right now going on with critical race theory and things like that. And people are like, you know, the, the governor of Oklahoma just said, he's like, well, if we teach some of this stuff, you know, it's gonna elicit negative responses and we don't wanna bring people apart. And I was like, so do you don't wanna teach them what happened? Like, <laughs> that's, the, that's the solution? You know what I mean? I don't understand that, but it, it, they're so worried about, you know, I don't know. It's just, I just it's, like, so you don't want to talk about World War II then? You want to talk right, about right, World right. War? Like, come on, man. Yeah, it doesn't apply to that, though. <laughs> so, um, uh, talk about your experience working in the NBA Players Union and, you know, what came to you being selected in there and maybe a, a story or two, you know, from that experience. Well, I was able to see the inner, you know, workings of the NBA and see the business of the NBA. 
and you know I was part of the negotiating team. So when we're in a lockout or coming to collective bargaining, um, I'm right there going to the meetings, uh, listening to the different things, learning about BRI, basketball related income, mm. uh, why the expansion to you know international was so important to David Stern, um, the institute, why you know instituting an age limit was so important. You know I'm, I'm I I learned it on a different level. And I, I think that it was, um, you know, from a business standpoint, you see the inner workings of the difference between David Stern and Adam Silver and the way they conduct their business and the way that they both, um, you know, put emphasis on, on different things. It's, mm. it's a totally different NBA, to be honest with you. Mm. Um, but, you know, it was, it was a great experience working with Billy Hunter. Uh, Billy Hunter was great, you know, taught me a lot. And it was, it was a great experience. Hmm. All right. So uh, just uh, three more questions and then we'll do yeah. some quick hitters and get out of here. Um, okay. So let's talk about the free Kadari movement and mm. <laughs> oh, <laughs> how the much failed, it, the failed free Kadari movement, <laughs> how, how much it, it like, sometimes I understand it. Um, but I just felt like, you know, like he was leading the ACC in steals and he was playing Listen. 20 something minutes a game. <laughs> it was written. Could, are you, have you followed me on Twitter? You saw every game. I was like, Did you ever text coach about it? Did you yeah. call him? Yeah. yeah. What'd he okay. say? What'd he say? He was just, he was just really gung ho about, you know, and it's nothing, <laughs> it's nothing against JG3. And I don't want to disparage him or anything like that. He was good at what he does. And what he is good at doing is catching and shooting. Yeah. Or the dribble up shot. Yeah coming off of a screen shot. Every time he does those things, I think is going in. Yeah. He was not, his, his, his qualities, assets were not bringing the ball up against pressure. They weren't defending or being active in the zone. <laughs> they weren't lateral movement to be able to keep somebody in front. Those, those are things that Kadari came with. Yeah. You know, driving and kicking to somebody and setting people up, running the team. That's all Kadari. So if you want to play him at the two, that I'm cool with that. But Kadari, it wasn't even close. It wasn't even close to me. It, it, like, yeah. like you know, sometimes you have two people competing for a position and it's close. Yeah. It wasn't even close <laughs> with Kadari. Yeah. I think Kadari should have played until he couldn't play anymore. Like I was like, you know, before you begin the Frank Howard minutes, man. Oh my gosh. <laughs> when, when, when it would kill me because Bayhaw was like, you know, well, he's not in shape to play, maybe only 20 minutes. I'm like, he looks like he is just fine to me. You play him <laughs> until he cannot move anymore. That dude, because it's a totally different game when he's in there. Like the whole game is different. The the only the only thing that that I could see from a coaching perspective, and I, I don't want to question you know Hall of Fame coach with his resume, but the the only thing that I could see was he didn't want Buddy playing the bottom of the zone, and I think that it's. You know, it, it's a situation where, where Kadari and one of those two would be a great match, you know, shooting wise offensively. But, um, you know, it, it's hard to keep, you know, two of your, you know, four or five best players off the floor and not play them at the same time. And then, you know, like I said, the thought of having, you know, Buddy playing, you know, at the bottom of the zone on one of the wings is is probably probably what led to that. So, um Another question. This is definitely going to put you on the spot. Um, Bayheim's not going to coach forever. Um, give me your give me your top three list of successors. Oh, top three list of successors. Well, Mike Hopkins has to be number one. Um, I don't know if he would want to come back. Um, everybody thought that he was going to be the the, the name. or well, he was the name coach yeah. successor, but it didn't happen. But um, I always thought that he was somebody who is waiting and, you know, he did a good job. He's doing a good job now. So I would like to see him come back after that. I don't know. Honestly, <laughs> I don't know. After that, uh, we talk about it and, you know, somebody in, you know, agent Archie has been there for a long time. Yeah. And, you know, you, you see, I know everybody is, is, you know, I, I don't know. I'll be honest with you. After, after my, those two names, I honestly I, I have my three, my three. So ooh, I, ooh, I would, ooh. I would have, I would have Red at the top, um, yeah. just because of how long he's been there. The players really rock with him. You know, yeah. he he's big in the big recruiting areas. You know, he's mm -hmm. done pretty well in Chicago, and then he's also obviously big in the DMV. Yeah. Um, so my number two would actually be, I feel like, kind of an upset, upset like dark horse candidate. I believe he was your teammate, Jason Hart. Oh, yeah. I, I think, you know, good. He, 
he has the experience and he definitely has the recruiting chops. Yeah. To make that happen. And then three, I would have G Mac. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So that, that's my three. I, I think okay. it'll be interesting to see how that's that. Not a bad three. All right. So you, you, don't, you don't have Mike Hopkins in your three. I just, I don't, I, I feel like it, it depends how Washington goes. It hasn't gone well so far, in my opinion. I mean, it started off, you know, off well. And, yeah. And, you know, the last two seasons, he's had some issues with players leaving the program. But, um, I mean, he still had pros. Uh, I, I just, I just don't, I don't know. I, I guess, like, I, th- I wonder if he has any animosity is a bad word. I wonder if he has a bad taste in his mouth from waiting in the wings and then I don't see I don't see how he wouldn't though. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I don't see how he wouldn't have it at least a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I, I just don't know if that would be enough to 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 make him feel that way. So um talk about your decision, you know, as parents, you know, to not let Malcolm play, you know, during COVID. And I'm sure that that was, that was probably something that was very frustrating, you know, for him. That was a difficult decision to make. Um, yeah. And every, there was so many unknowns and we, you know, my, my the girls, they're, you know, big with volleyball, Metro volleyball and, um, you know, moving up and they were ready to have them start traveling and everything. And I mean, COVID was just something that it was something that we've never seen before. You know what I mean? So we didn't really know how to deal with it. And the more you read, the more confused you got and different opinions and different everything. And, you know, and for a while, you know, for many months, half of the country was saying it was a hoax. They were saying it wasn't real. Even though we were literally seeing people dying, they were like, no, it's a hoax. So it it was just so much uncertainty. Yeah, It was a tough, you know, so we just kind of stayed and we just kind of stay quarantined and, you know, worked out and everything like that. But it was tough. I mean, it was Malcolm's first year in high school. Yeah. And, you know, he was excited to come. But that's when, you know, he was in communication with Coach Jones the whole time. And he definitely understood. And he wasn't, you know, he was like, listen, this is new for all of us. So we all kind of just kind of, you know, so I definitely understand. <laughs> you know, so it wasn't like a, you know, a part. He was like, Malcolm's not going to be penalized. And, you know, the yeah. Metro volleyball coaches said the same thing about the girls and yeah, you know, it was was a tough situation. It was, it it was definitely some moments where I was just like, what are we doing here? Like we walked in, I think the first time we were allowed to to be in the gym, Mm -hmm. Uh, the coaches had to have gloves on. And if you've ever worked in a restaurant, those plastic gloves, they're not very durable. (laughs) So, you know, as a coach, you know, a lot of the time you're catching the ball from your kids, they relocate to a spot for a shot. So you're catching this ball and it would be like it would be like maybe ten passes, and then you turn to look at the other coach, be like, "Dag, man, like, come, come get me, man, some." <laughs> so I had to switch out, and like yeah. we had to switch out our gloves whenever they got drinks and sanitize. I'm just yeah. like listening. Yeah. You know, it's good for us to be in the gym, though. Like it was definitely important for us and for the kids. Like you could just right. stop there, just like get me out of the house, man. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So last question before we do the quick hitters. Um, you know, I saw that you were a teammate of Hubert Davis. And as a UNC oh, fan, I have to ask about, you know, how you feel about, you know, him getting that position um, at UNC, you know, one of the most powerful, you know, positions in, in college sports and, you know, how you think he's going to do there and, you know, what the teams are going to look like. I think he's going to do great. You know what I mean? Hubert is a, is a great guy. I mean, he is somebody has, he's, he's been passionate about, you know, basketball and everybody that knows him, he has a basketball mind. And this is even before, you know, going to sit on the bench uh, with USA. I mean, I think he's, I think he's going to do great. Um, It was unfortunate that he started off and got the Twitter backlash when he, you know, with with the way his description was, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about when he first got there and he was on the uh, stage and they were like, okay, you're the first black coach that's ever been, you know, you know, for UNC history and everything like that. Yeah. And then Hubert Davis said, you know, I'm, I'm proud to be the first black coach, but I'm also proud that my wife is white. And it was the way he phrased it. And then <laughs> social media came for it. It was like, you're proud that your wife is white. Is that, <laughs> is that what you're saying? So it was, it was, I was like, dang, Hubert, you didn't say that right. I know what you're trying to say when you try to, you want to rewind for him and, and say it again a different way. But I, you know, but Hubert's a great guy. So he's going to have definite success there. So I wish him nothing but success. 
I'm I'm not gonna lie. So when he was hired, I was you know kind of on board, especially everything I read from the players being on board and you know coaches and stuff. The one the one hesitation I had was the assistant coaches that he brought on don't you know some of them have a ton of experience. Um, like uh, Jeff Lebo uh, joined the staff, and then right. it was just the the thought of some of their other coaches, you know, like Sean May and stuff like that. It's like I just wonder you know, recruiting wise, you know, where they're, where they're at there. But again, I, I just kind of want to give it some chance to breathe and, you know, hope that everything works out. So, all right, let's hit some quick hitters real quick. Okay. Uh, the best player you played with or with or against who never made it to the league. Who never made it to the league. Yeah. Winfrey Walton. You mm. remember him? No. Ah, you don't remember him. Go what look back. Winford Walton. Okay. Yeah, so they'll, they, you go back and look, class of 96, come out of high school, he was usually ranked right in that top one, two, three with Kobe and, and uh, Tim Thomas. He was, oh, wow. he was the truth. Yeah, he was the truth. Wow. Uh, historical coach you wish you could have played for? <laughs> Probably John Thompson. Mm, that's a good yeah, one. I'll say John Thompson. Game show that you think you'd win? Ooh. Ooh, that's a tough one. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I don't know, man. <laughs> That's a tough one there. I feel, like you'd, be, I feel like you'd be pretty solid with Jeopardy. No, like, if you would no. say Jeopardy, some of that miscellaneous stuff, I don't know that. <laughs> I, I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, I don't know those. I had Steve Turner from Gonzaga on. He said Family Feud, and I was like, that's a good one. I family like Feud, maybe, though. Okay. Uh, invite three basketball minds to a dinner to chop it up with. Oh, definitely Kareem. Definitely Bill Russell. <laughs> um, like Mood Abdul Rauf. You know what I mean? But nice. Definitely those three. A lot of stories. Yeah. Uh, MJ or LeBron? MJ. Thank you. Okay. Uh, what book is a must read for every basketball coach? Ah, oh, that's tough. John Wooden had a really good book. I'm trying to think of what it's called. Um, Ah! Oh, I, I thought the one written about him was really interesting. Did you did you see that one? It was like four hundred something pages. I didn't it see was, that one. It was a complete. Uh, it it was written about him, but he definitely wasn't involved in the project. And there was a lot of like stuff about UCLA and boosters and stuff in there that kind of exposed, you know. A lot. It, yeah. It, yeah, but I thought that that one was really interesting. So. Okay. Okay. So just one, I mean, he has, he's got a lot of great books. So uh, this one is probably a little bit personal for you. You might, this might've happened to you. Uh, would you rather take a charge from Shaq or try to guard KD with the game on the line? Which one would I rather have? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, guarding KD is not going to hurt you. So uh, I'd, probably, <laughs> I'd probably go with that one. <laughs> Shaq, you know, look, guarding Shaq, honestly, if he wanted to, he could have literally hurt everybody that tried to guard him. He was just a nice guy. We were just lucky that he was nice. You know <laughs> what I mean? But literally, he could have hurt everybody. Yeah. Um, best dynasty in basketball. Dang. I mean, when you go back to the it, – it's so tough because if, if, if Shaq and Kobe would have stayed together, they could have been the best dynasty. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that wasn't the question. <laughs> I go, I know. <laughs> I mean, you got to go with Bill Russell with how many championships they won. I mean, mm. that's mm. Well, nobody's nobody's done that. It's a good one. Yeah. Uh, who's an underrated Twitter follow? Underrated Twitter follower. You know, I just started following Rex Chapman. Mm. I'll say you're the second honest. person that said that. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it was unexpected too, though. So yeah, yeah. definitely Rex Chapman. Yeah, the blocker charge stuff is always funny with him. Yeah. I really enjoyed the, the the pod that you had with him. That was a good yeah, one. It was good. It was good. Um, great podcast or YouTube series? Great podcast or YouTube series? Well, I respect all the guys that, you know, the, the former guys that are doing it, like all the smoke and, you know, the knuckleheads and, you know what I mean? So I like to see former players, you know, doing going into the media and doing media differently. Mm. Uh, so I'm enjoying those. I like the JJ Reddick one. Oh I, yeah, JJ Reddick one is good. Enjoy Definitely. this podcast. Yeah. He's so he's so candid. I hate that I like him now. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> it's so tough. He's one of those players where you always you hated him. It, it is 
He talks about it too, though. But yeah, yeah, and I'm sure he's fine with that. So, yeah. what was the first time that you were in a room where you realized you didn't know anything about basketball? Hmm. Well, that I had a lot that I needed to learn was well, probably yeah. with the with the um, with the um, with the union because yeah. the, you know, I didn't know all those intricate details of it. So mm-hmm. I'm young. You know, I got elected to be the player rep, and I'm going there for the first big meeting. And they're talking about all this different stuff. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know any of this stuff. So I'll say that. Okay. First meeting. Gotcha. And then last one is the uh, the hardest shot in basketball. The hardest shot? Yeah. So, like, my answer for this is I I hate the, the short corner or block floater when you get it in transition. And you have, like, a second to get it off before you get swatted. And you can't use the backboard. You no, know? You can't, I was going to say use the backboard. But if you can't yeah. use the backboard, then, yeah, definitely. That's not even a question. That's the hardest one. Okay. Yeah, All right. <laughs> so this is one of my favorite parts of the podcast. The last part is I, I turn the tables and I allow you to ask me a question. So uh, what, do you, what do you got for me? Well, Wow. See, I don't want to ask you what you don't want to talk about. <laughs> you can't. You can if you want to talk about that. Uh, in a perfect scenario, yeah. With Coach Jones leaving, yeah. and going to VTech, how should the situation have been handled? I mean, let me pick my words carefully. <laughs> I don't want to be hasty about that. <laughs> okay. So, first off, I, I would have. I would have liked to to have a conversation with administration and with the athletic director when it happened. Be mm-hmm. like, this is this is where we're at. You know, this is what we're thinking. You know, this is where we want it to go. You know, what's your guys' input? You know what I'm saying? Or uh-huh. you know, what are your guys' thoughts right now? Like, where are you at? You know, um, so just some communication there. And um, I mean, I've. I feel like I've said it without saying it. I I, I think that it, it, the interim coach, um, it didn't make sense to me that it didn't come from within the program. Mm-hmm. And I thought it was disrespectful to, I mean, f- for me, it's just like, bro, I didn't go to DeMatha. I've been here three years. That's nothing. These, these coaches that I work with, um, they all played at DeMatha. Um, some of them have been coaching there longer than Jones. You know, like Reggie Vini was there, you know, a year or two before Jones came. So he's been there for like 21 years. Um, Other guys, you know, Daryl Green, you know, good friend and mentor of mine. You know, he's in he's in the Basketball Hall of Fame. (laughs) He he played like eight years professionally. Like he coached at the Matha for like five, six years, you know, coaches with team takeover. Shoot, he recruited half of our roster. Um, I, I just wish that there had been more of a process. And that these exemplary, you know, leaders within the program that we have here would have at least had the opportunity to interview for the job. It was it was the fact that there was no opportunity to do so, um, that there was no communication with us or, you know, frankly, with, you know, the players and the parents. Um, And it's it was just unfortunate that it, it seemed like no one knew what was going on. It's like to the administration, to them, it didn't, it didn't seem like they knew what they wanted to do. And they just kind of like, "Eh, we should probably do this, you know, like, let's just put this interim coach in. And then, you know, in January, we'll deal with it then. I'm just like, I don't understand, (laughs) you know, you, you have an entire summer to interview candidates. Mm -hmm. You know, we had Reggie Vini running things. When, when coach left, everything was smooth. You know, none of the players wanted to transfer. We were running our workouts. It was business as usual. You know, we're running the same offense. We're doing all the same stuff. And, you know, I think, I think, you know, kids, you know, that, that stability was key for them. So, like I said, you know, just having, you know, that communication and the opportunity for, you know, these leaders to, to apply for a job that I think that they have every right to apply for. Um, and just a bit more transparency. Um, it, it kind of seemed like the administration was like, uh, I think you should talk to him. Right. Uh, I think you should talk to him. Right. And it just right. didn't seem like, it's like, can we at least know who is making these decisions or right. understand the rationale of these decisions? And it was kind of just, uh, you know, we decided this and, you know, That's deal with it. and, um, you know, I, I wish, you know, coach Strickland the best. I, I wish, the, you know, the DeMatha players the best and, 
you know, the, the, the assistant coaches and stuff like that. Um, it just didn't seem like a, a good, a good fit for me, you know, my career anymore, you know, very thankful for, you know, DeMatha and, you know, the very limited platform that I, that I have and, you know, all the knowledge that I gained from coach Jones and everything I learned from his staff. I mean, there, there's so much that I've learned in these three years about, you know, treating people the right way and, you know, mentoring kids and, and stuff like that. And, and that's why I said, you know, I was so upset as far as, you know, these, these men not getting an opportunity and, and not just these men, like these black men that, you know, I, I talked about representation and how important it is. And, you know, there's, you know, two or three coaches on staff, you know, you know, Casey, you know, coach Cromer and, and coach, coach Green specifically that have really mentored me and really taken me under, under their wing. And there's been situations that that happened that I needed help with, or I needed, you know, an ear, you know, I, or I needed, you know, prayer or anything that I needed, you know, they, they were, they cared about me off the court. You know, I, I talked to them about, you know, my, my brother being diagnosed with, with cancer and, you know, within the next week, like each of them comes in every once in a while and checks in on me. Like they don't have to do that. I don't work there anymore, <laughs> you know? And so I think, that that level of care for an assistant coach and, and and I know that our players and not just the star players like I know our players get the same thing from them mm -hmm. you know there's there's a player that I was at the end of the bench that I know DG talks to every day mm -hmm. that isn't even playing at the D1 level and so I, I think that you know we're not coaching high school basketball for money we're definitely not coaching for clout or for fame you know, we're, we're, we're in this for the right reasons. And, you know, coach Jones uh, assembled a great staff of, of, of people that truly care about the right things. Um, and so, you know, I really hope that that, you know, plays out with, with the organization in the coming months. So that was a very long winded answer for, oh, for your very, question. Very well said. So I'm glad that you, that you expressed it that way. Very well said. Yep. All right. Well, I appreciate you coming on, sir. Um, let's, you know, uh, plug, you know, your podcast and, you know, anything that you have going on and, and, and tell the people where they can find you on, on social media. Great, great. Well, you know, I'm a senior writer for basketballnews.com and um, that's where the rematch is house. Uh, the rematch is my podcast and I write articles for them. I also write for the guardian and uh, the undefeated. And uh, my website is atonthomas.com. And my Twitter is at Aton Thomas 36, same as Instagram. Fantastic. One, la one last thing. I want, I want to apply a little bit of pressure. No, it is no. also on my podcast, Dream Team, to, to have Gilbert Arenas on. So I'm not All saying right. you have to, but if you can get him on, I would hey, be. I'll, I'll, great, I'll, I'll, I'll add him. You know what I mean? He, Gilbert likes to talk. So he <laughs> does give me now. He likes to talk. So I'll, I'll send him the message. Definitely true. Appreciate the time, and uh, you have you have a great day. Take care. All right, you too.